Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful to him and bless his name. Worshiping God is a blessing and certainly a a privilege for us as God's children. You see, when the church follows God's blueprint for acceptable worship, the church is going to grow. And what we want to focus our attention on today as we continue our study in God's blueprint for a growing church, we want to talk about how the church grows in relation to following God's commandments for worship that is meaningful. And when worship is meaningful and it is always rendered, because we follow God's blueprint, God's church will grow. Let's have a word of prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, we are so grateful unto thee for this day. We thank you so much for the privilege that is ours now as we enter into this time of Bible study together, Father, and we're thankful for this privilege that is ours to open up your word. Father, we so, we're so grateful for your word and what it means to us. We're thankful that you give it to us, that we can use it to guide our lives, but to, to live our lives by as well, Father, and we're ever grateful for all that you do for us. Father, we're thankful for the church. We're thankful for your son who died and purchased that church and the sacrifice that he offered to us at Calvary that was extended through your love and grace and mercy. Father, we're also grateful that in just a short while we'll be able to enter into worship. And Father, we pray as we do so that as we lift up our voices in praise and sing those songs and as we pray, pray to you and as we remember the death and sacrifice of your son, as we commune together, as we listen to your word proclaimed, Father, help us to have open and honest hearts. Help us to understand the importance of what worship is and how you desire that from us. Father, we continue to pray for our congregation. We're thankful that we continue to take steps forward um, in a progressive way that helps us to be back together. Thankful for the directive of our elders as they continue to guide us in that direction. Pray you'll continue to watch over these men and bless them as well as their families. Father, we pray for our deacons and the tasks they have at hand as they continue to help us to move forward as well with the programs and keeping the building in order and the other things in which they're busy doing. Father, we're grateful for them as well and also for their families and their support. Father, help us to all encourage and to be united together as we stand in Christ. Help us to continue to shine the light of your message to the world. Father, we continue to pray for those in our church who are hurting at this time and who are suffering with illnesses and cancer treatments and who are in the hospital and certainly those who have uh, dealt with COVID or the loss of loved ones. And Father, we pray that you'll bless them and comfort them in the best way that you can. Father, we thank you for loving us. We thank you for the privilege of being called your children. We thank you for the country in which we live that enables us to to have this medium by which we can uh, share the message of your gospel. And we pray that continues. We pray for our leaders. And we pray they make those decisions that are godly towards a united country in Christ, Father. But we know that it's our responsibility as your children to direct those people in your paths. Help us to share your message. Help us to see that the fields are widened to harvest. Father, thank you again for you for all that you do for us and the blessings that you give us. Thank you again for this time together. But most of all, we thank you for Jesus. And all of this we ask in your son's most precious and holy name. Amen. So when you think about worship and, and how we render worship to God, what is, what is meant by meaningful worship? Well, worship is defined in the book as man's response to God's revelation. And this was also taken from Brother Batzel Barrett Baxter's book, and family of God. If you recall, he was a wonderful gospel preacher, but it's the psalmist who declared and described worship as satisfying man's insatiable need for God. In the New Testament, the word worship is translated from a number of different Greek words. However, only three of those words appear multiple times, including these three in the Greek that we see, and that's also referenced in our book. Proskuneo, which means to kiss the hand. So it's a directive action towards something that we're rendering towards God. Lutreu, which is to render or offer religious service gifts, or sebomai, which means to serve. And so accordingly, when you think about these three words in relation to what it means to worship God, it's actually making an action towards kissing the hand towards God and rendering service and offering these religious service gifts. So meaningful worship then, it's not entertainment or 
a performance. It's not something we do to have God clap his hands at us and say, oh, that was such a good job. That's not what worship is. Rather, it's an outward expression of our worship in reference and adoration for and our service to God because he's our heavenly father. And so when we think about what is meant by the term of meaningful worship, it's about what we're giving to God as He directs us to worship Him. So why then is meaningful worship so important? Well, because God commands it. Remember, God tells us in John 4 and verse 24 that God is a spirit, and those that worship Him must worship Him in spirit and in truth. So it's, it's not God telling us, well, when you're thinking about it or if you feel like it, God says those that worship Him have to worship Him according to God's directives and standards, but that we do it in spirit and according to the truth of which God gives us. Jesus tells us how we are to worship God. When we worship God as God has directed us in His Word, then what we're doing is we're demonstrating this true attitude towards God and towards Jesus that's recorded for us in John chapter 14. And we're also safeguarding ourselves against sinning because we're putting our mind and attention towards something that's going to keep our minds on the prize of eternity. And we exert an influence for good upon Christians as well as non-Christians. And when we render worship that's pleasing to God, as Paul says in 2 Corinthians there, uh, 5 and verse 9, therefore we make it our aim, whether present or absent, to be well-pleasing to Him or to God. So meaningful worship is extremely important because God is worthy and He deserves to be worshipped. When you think about what God did for us at Calvary, when you think about the premise of what the cross represents to us, is it not difficult for us then to to be able to worship God and, and show reverence and adoration towards what He's done for us based upon what Calvary represents to us as Christians? Recall 2 Samuel 22 and verse 4. I will call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. You see, meaningful worship is important because it satisfies man's greatest need. One of man's greatest needs is a need to worship and to commune with God, just as God wants to have that relationship with us. That's why he extended the offering of salvation through Calvary and what Jesus did. And so when we worship God in spirit and in truth, What we're doing is we're expressing love. We're we're expressing our adoration and certainly our appreciation to what God did for us at Calvary. And so therefore it brings into view everything that God did for us when we're worshiping. So every act that we follow through which God has shown us and directed us to follow then brings forth the concept and the idea of what it means to put our hearts into worship. I had someone say one time, you know, I didn't really get anything out of worship well, then you didn't put anything into worship. You know, it doesn't matter if the preacher's dry or, you know, if if you're just not feeling it that day or you woke up tired or you stayed up too late the night before or you had to work, whatever it is, you have to put into and make the effort to make sure that your worship is acceptable and pleasing to God. And it's all about our attitude. So what attitudes are needed then for us to have worship that's meaningful to God? Meaningful worship is always rendered, as the book tells us, from an attitude of humility seeking always to follow God and His design for what worship is. Again, God is a spirit, and they that worship Him must worship Him according to His pattern. Jesus continued to exercise all authority in spiritual matters, including worship. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him or by him, as it says in the King James Version. And so the scope of Jesus' authority envelops all people. John 17 and verse 2, And you have given him authority over all flesh, that he should give eternal life to as many as you have given him. And so therefore, it pertains to worship. Every activity, every teaching must be done in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, based upon the authority which God has given him. So as we examine the scriptures, the the things that we learn from what the scriptures tell us is, is that we're to worship God in the correct object. God is that correct object, rather. 
There's nothing else with which we worship. We're not worshiping idols or, or little gods with little G's. Or, but yet sometimes people worship their possessions. They worship their time. They worship other things other than what God has directed, and that's to be worshiping Him. We're to worship God in spirit. Again, this goes back to worshiping God with this proper attitude. You know, is my attitude of a negative connotation when I come into worship? Am I upset with a brother or sister across the way that I had not reconciled with or fixed the problem or gone to and asked forgiveness? All of these things can play into and affect my worship to God, and then my worship is not pleasing to Him because my attitude is not right. Am I worshiping God in truth? That is, in an authorized manner. Are we singing in a way that's pleasing to God? Is it a cappella, without the accompaniment of instrumental music? Are we praying to God? Do we have the authorized men leading us in, the, in those worship services? All of these things fall into line with worshiping God in truth that is in realm of what it means to worship God in an authorized manner. Do we worship God decently and in order? We're not making a big spectacle of things. We're, we're not doing things to be seen of men. And then finally, do we respect the silence of the Scriptures? We're not adding to or taking away. We're not putting things into worship that are not there. We're not implementing different um, things on the Lord's Supper other than what God has prescribed and given in His Word. Because what we have to remember is that we have to avoid, we have to avoid and reject teachings that are doctrines of men. You think about Colossians chapter 2, right? 22 through 22, or 20 through 22. Therefore, it says what? If, what God is telling us, if you died with Christ from the basic principles of the world, what he's telling us then, though, as you're living in the world, do you subject yourselves to regulations? Do not touch, do not taste, do not handle, with all concerned things which perish with the using according to the commandments of the doctrines of men? So are you following after the ways of what man is prescribing, which we see in the religious world on a continual basis, or are you doing them according to God's standards? Meaningful worship is always rendered from an attitude seeking to please and glorify God. And so one of the highest purposes is to praise and glorify God. Again, going back to what Paul writes here, we're not doing this based upon simple traditions of what man says according to commandments and the doctrines of men. Even Jesus said, but you know, but in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So we avoid and reject the teaching and doctrines of men that would encourage us to engage in worship outside the specific instructions of God. So our meaningful worship is always rendered with an attitude that pleases and glorifies God. One of life's highest purposes, again, as I said previously, is to praise and glorify God. Look at what the psalmist says in Psalm 50, 22 and 23. Now consider this, you who forget God, lest I tear you in pieces, and there be none to deliver. Moreover, offer praise glorifies me. And to him who orders his conduct aright, I will show the salvation of God. And so worship was never designed to entertain or to please men. You know, when people say, well, I didn't get anything out of worship, you know, it sounds harsh on the outset when we say this, but worship is not about you. But if we worship God in His prescribed manner, we put into it with the proper attitude, we're going to get something out of it. Instead, worship focuses always, is always to be directed toward and designed to please God. And when we do that, certainly we should gain something from that. Hebrews 13 and verse 5, the writer said, Therefore, by him let us continually offer the sacrifices of praise to God, that is, the fruit of our lips giving thanks to who? Not to us, to his name. We have to remember that true worship is more than a formal ceremony or an external pomp and pageantry, pageantry right? You know, when when I see some of these churches online or on TV and I, and I see the pomp and circumstance and the light shows and the bands and the smoke and all of these different things, the people in the audience are not paying attention to God. They're watching the stage. They're looking at the light show. Their mind is not directed on what Jesus Christ did or what the cross of Calvary means. Are their words directed towards you know, the drummer who's th laying down good beat tracks or the guitar player who just ripped a great solo in the name of Christ? 
No, that's not worship, and that's not what God wants. Giving thanks to his name by the fruit of our lips, offering praise to God because he deserves to be praised. It's much more than, than also an intellectual exercise. Every act of worship that we do and that God prescribes and every expression of praise, again, goes back to the simple concept of bringing praise and glory to God. You see, when we assemble for worship on the day that God has designed, that's Sunday, the first day of the week, then we glorify God. And this is a directive given to us in His Word. Now, on the first day of the week, when the disciples came together to break bread, Paul, ready to depart the next day, spoke to them and continued his preaching or his message until midnight. Now, I promise you, I'm not going to preach until midnight today, but what we can see there is that their minds were directed, no matter the time, at worshiping and praising God. And so when we sing, in our hearts, that's the instrument commanded, we continually offer sacrifice and praise to God. This is directive given to us in Colossians 3.19 and also what we see here, speaking to one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. So God prescribes the instrument with which we're supposed to give our voice to. And so we sing in tune with what our heart is. That's what's here. We also pray, and we do so from the same instrument that God prescribes for singing, with the heart. 1 Corinthians 14, 15, Paul writes, What is the conclusion then? I will pray with the Spirit, and I will also pray with understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will also sing with understanding. And so when we pray to God... We pray for what that which we're thankful for, for the hour of worship. We're asking God to help us and bless us, but we're giving praise and thanks to God because of what He's done for us. We also partake of the Lord's Supper in a worthy manner, remembering and redeeming the sacrifice of Jesus, our Savior. Now, one thing I want people to understand, and I want us all to understand this, the Lord's Supper is not more important than any other aspect of worship. Because if we leave any aspect or any portion of worship which God has prescribed out of that which God has given to us and given us a commandment for on Sunday, then everything we do is in vain. You know, I, I remember when I was preaching in Alabama, they did the, uh, the Lord's Supper at the end of the service. So it was after the sermon, they did the Lord's Supper, they did um, uh, the, the collection, you know, um, as prescribed by worship, taking up the collection, and then finally, they would do a, a closing prayer. And one day, I just simply asked someone, you know, why do you decide to do the, the, the Lord's Supper at the end of worship? And one of the elders told me, he said, because we had people that were partake of the Lord's Supper at the beginning, and they would get up and leave, as if that was the only meaningful, important part of worship. Well, as long as I partook of the implements of the Lord's Supper, then I'm good for the day, right? That negates every aspect of what it means to worship God in spirit and in truth. And so, yes, it's an important part of worship, but it's not the most important part of worship. And so when we partake of the Lord's Supper, we do so in a worthy manner of which we've done so through that worship service in giving our minds and directives and giving our and following the directives and giving our attention to God, remembering that redeeming sacrifice of Jesus, just as Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, right? And so when we do these things as, as he has prescribed to us, we follow after that continual steadfast in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And so why do we do this? Because when we're listening to God's word preach, meaningful worship is always rendered from an attitude of reflection. David described his intense worship towards God and his humility towards God was what was offering him. As the deer pants for waters, brooks, so pants my soul for you. O God, my soul thirsts for you, for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? Paul, in the context of worship, challenged every member in the Corinthian church to examine himself in 1 Corinthians eleven twenty-eight, 28. So what Paul was doing was Paul was stressing the importance of personal reflection when desiring to worship God acceptably. And so that personal reflection requires us to ask ourselves some questions. And this is what Brother Mike Winkler gives us in the book. When we worship God, he, the, the first question he asks is, when we worship God, is our attitude arrogant like the Pharisees? Do, do we act like we scarcely need God? 
You know, the Pharisees, remember the Pharisee and the publican, as they went up to the temple to pray to God, what did the Pharisee do? Pounded his chest, Lord, look at how great and awesome I am, right? And we see the attitude of the publican who bowed his head and, and could hardly even approach because he didn't think he was worthy. So we should never have an attitude in worship of like, yeah, I'm here, God, but I don't really need you. You know, our personal reflection requires us to ask those questions, am I arrogant in my attitude towards worship? The next question Brother Winkler asks, when we worship, are our motives impure? That is, are we trying to be noticed by other people? Am I flashing that check so people can see how much money I'm putting in the collection plate? Am I pulling out that wad of cash so people know how much money I have? You know, am, am I offering these? And, and please don't misunderstand me when I say this, but I'm, I'm sure that you've experienced this. I've seen, unfortunately, men who will pray to be seen of men and not of God. They offer these big, eloquent prayers and voice with boisterous voices, and you can just tell from the attitude by which they're delivering it that it's not coming from a place of humility and offering love and reverence to God, but rather they want people to be impressed with the way in which they pray. And again, I'm not trying to judge here, but it's pretty evident when that happens, and it's only happened a few times that I've noticed. But our motives should not be impure. That is, we're not trying to be noticed by other people in the congregation. Our attention is, is to be focused on God, and we want God to pay attention to what we're doing. So when we worship, we want to make sure that our actions are not in vain. And so the next question Brother Winkler asks is, when we worship God, are our actions in vain? Do, do we ignore God's instruction for worship and substitute what we want? Do we desire something else to be in there? Do we want instrumental music or we putting women up to, to, lead, to, to lead prayers or read scripture reading. You know, all of those things which God has not prescribed for us in the pattern which he's given to us in his word. That's not what God desires from us, nor is it what he wants from us. We must always know that how we worship God is important as to why we worship him. We worship God in spirit and in truth. The why of the worship is, it's because he's worthy to be praised. Again, 2 Samuel 22 and verse 4. And accordingly, because he's worthy to be praised, then we must submit to and follow God's blueprint for worship. We truly want to be pleasing to God in every aspect. Why? Because when we do this, we go back to the title of the book. When we follow God's blueprint for rendering worship that's acceptable to God, the church is going to grow. Sometimes people have difficulty with that concept and understanding because some people will say, well, I don't see the church growing. We're worshiping all exactly like we're supposed to. Yeah, but the church doesn't necessarily grow in numbers. It grows spiritually. And remember, the church isn't just about numbers. Certainly, we want to teach and, and reach lost souls, but it's also about us growing spiritually and connecting as a congregation in fellowship and rendering to God that which God deserves to be rendered or what God is due. And so when we submit to and follow God's blueprint for worship, then we are truly pleasing to him and the church is going to grow. That's what we want to do. That's our desire. I had a friend one time, he was preaching in a gospel meeting and he said afterwards, and I might have shared this story with you before, but he said afterwards a gentleman came up to him and he said, you don't motivate me. And he said, well, if the cross of Calvary doesn't motivate you, I don't know what will, because he had preached on the cross that day. You see, he was more concerned with the messenger rather than the message, and that's important for us to remember too. Certainly, we want our sermons delivered in a manner in which is going to pique our interest and keep us, keep us focused on the importance of what worship is, but at the same time, if that message is true and speaking the truth and according to God's word, then that's what we need to hear, and that's what we need to focus on, and that's what we have to remember. And so when we come to worship today, when we think about worshiping God, what are we putting into that which God has prescribed for us to do? Do we have the proper attitude? Are we paying attention? Are we prepared? We get prepared for worship before we get to worship. You know, you know we're not, and again, parents, I understand. I've got four children myself. I know how this goes, but sometimes we get behind, right? We're rushing around, and we come in, and we sit down in the pew, and we're like, oh, I'm glad to finally be here. These kids are driving me crazy. Couldn't get them dressed this morning. The babies were crying. Couldn't find the diapers. Their clothes were dirty. 
those things happen. I understand that. And we all have those bad days. I've had those bad days. We get in an argument with our spouse on the way to worship. But when we walk through that door, we need to have an attitude of reverence and respect towards God. Our attitude and our reflection of the world needs to be put behind us. And the the things that we're thinking about and all of those outward cares and, and concerns are left outside the church building and those few short moments that we have with God to commune and worship Him and to remember the death and burial of His Son, Jesus Christ. So let's focus on those things when we worship today. And let's make sure that our worship is in spirit and in truth. If you're watching with us online as a visitor, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for for choosing to to click on our link for this time and study. And as always, if you have any questions, I do hope that you'll reach out to us. You can find all of our information at carrycoc.org or you can email me directly at minister at carrycoc.org. And certainly to our church family, thank you for being here online today. And if you're able to be with us for worship today, that's wonderful. I'm looking forward to seeing you. If you're not able to be with us, then just know that you're missed and we look forward to seeing you very soon. We see more and more people every Sunday as they get their shots and more people are venturing out and that's a wonderful and a true blessing as as our church attendance, and and again, it's not about the numbers, but as our church attendance to increase because people are feeling more safe and comfortable, we're certainly thankful for that blessing, but also know that as you're at home worshiping with us, just know that you're loved and you're missed greatly. I hope you have a wonderful and blessed week. Looking forward to seeing you again soon. Take care. God bless.